All right, well, so I will call this meeting of the MAPC Executive Committee to order. My name is Adam Chapteling. I'm the MAPC Vice President and the Arlington Town Manager. Um, I th think I have met most of you, although I know my, my most of my tenure has been remote here. So, um, you know, look forward to getting getting back together in a room with all of you. Uh, I'll be chairing the meeting today in Erin Wartman's absence. Um, she's unable to attend today, so I'll do my best to, to step in and chair this meeting. Uh, so with that, I believe, Heidi, I'm, I, you need me to call the roll to open the meeting? Yep. Um, Sasha, are we all set with streaming? Great. All right. So I will begin by calling the roll, and then we will get right into the agenda. So I have my list here. Sharonda Almeida, if you could just respond affirmatively when I call your name. Here. John Barros. John Keith Bergman. I saw here. Keith. <clears throat> Present. Karen Canfield. Here. Adam Chaplin, I'm here. Robert Cohen. <laughs> Mayor Curtitoni. Tom Daniel. I'm here. John DePriest. Here. Yolanda Greaves. Here. Sandra Hackman. Here. Mo Handel. Here. Jared Johnson. Tabor Keeley. Here. Steve Olinoff. Caitlin Pasifaro. No. George Paracas. No. Courtney Rainey. Present. Jenny Raitt. Here. Vandana Rao. Present. Sam Seidel. Here. Steve Silvera. Lauren Shirtliff. Here. Thank you. Mayor Spicer. Present. Hi, Mayor. Hi. Juan Vega. No. Elaine Wynia. Here. And Aaron Warman is not here. All right. Do, uh, do, I, do I need to call for the past president's non-voting? Is Heidi? Uh, I'm sorry. I was looking at the chat section. Uh, what well, was it again, Adam? Uh, do, I, do I need to ask if Buzz and Rick are here? No. Uh, no. Okay. no. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> okay. All right. With that, thank you, everybody. I'll try, I'll, I'll try to get faster and faster each time I call the roll yep. here. Uh, and so Adam, Jared, Jared Johnson is on the call. Hey, folks. Hi, sorry, Jared. Late. No, okay. it's all right. Welcome. Welcome. We are actually, uh, we're joined by two new members, uh, two ex officio members. So maybe we could just take a moment uh, for Courtney, Courtney and Lauren to introduce themselves. Um, normally we'd go around the table and have everyone introduce themselves, but you know, in this format, I think maybe it'd just be great if you could both introduce yourselves in your roles. Oh, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, hi, Courtney Rainey. I'm the Director of Government Affairs and Municipal Partnerships at MassDEP, uh, formerly at the State House. So in my previous life, I had done some economic development work for my old boss, uh, Rep Hogan, uh, with MAPC in one of our commissions that we chaired up there. Um, so I am happy to sort of be back in an arena that I'm a little more familiar with um, and happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Courtney. Welcome, Courtney. Lauren? Hi, everyone. Uh, Lauren Shirtleff, uh, Boston Planning and Development Agency's Director of Planning. Um, sorry, I have a cold right now. Um, excited to uh, start working with you guys and see what we can accomplish. Thank you for having me. Great. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome, Welcome to you both. Lauren. <laughs> All right, so we will now move to the approval of the minutes of the October 21st, 2020 meeting. Uh, do we have any questions or comments uh, or amendments to the minutes? And if not, do we have a motion to approve? A motion to approve. Second. Motion's been made and seconded to approve the minutes. Any discussion on the minutes? All right. Seeing none, I will call the roll. I will just try to call everybody's first name to try to streamline it here. Uh, Sharonda? Here. I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John Barros, not, I don't believe he's here. Keith? Aye. Karen? Aye. Adam, I vote yes. Uh, Robert? Not here. Mayor Curtitoni's not here. Tom? Aye. John DePriest? Aye. Yolanda? 
Aye. Sandra? Yes. Mo? Aye. Jared? Aye. Tabor? Aye. Steve? I don't think Steve's here. Uh, Caitlin Passafaro, has she joined? No. George Proikas, has he joined? No. Courtney? Aye. Jenny? Aye. Vandana? Aye. Sam? Uh, aye. I'm not sure if Steve has joined. No. Lauren? Aye. Mayor Spicer? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Juan, I don't believe Juan is here. Elaine? Aye. All right. Minutes pass. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. All right. What is next? All right. Next, we are going to move to the report of the treasurer. So with that, I will turn it over to Sam for his report. Adam, thank you very much. Hello to everybody. I uh, hope you're enjoying this cold weather and the snow coming tomorrow. Today for the Treasurer's Report, we are gonna look at the income statements for September and October of this year, which will take us up to a third of the FY21 year um, and give us a sense about sort of where we're going. We're gonna first look at September. The overall news on both these income statements is that the numbers are good. Uh, the September uh, report, a couple of things to note uh, that our revenue was higher by a lot than expected. And the reason for that is not so much money coming to MAPC, but pass through money that was going uh, through the streetlight program, the LED streetlight program and the taxi livery service. Uh, but otherwise our direct labor and our administrative expenses, which are kind of the core metrics we follow uh, we're pretty pretty close to budget, um, leaving us a little bit above our overhead rate that we are targeting. Our target overhead rate is 123%. We ended up at 124% and a cumulative overhead rate of 125%, which again is above the 123. We don't love those numbers, uh, but, but we're okay with them. If we go on to October, uh, the situation improves, uh, gets even better. Basically, we hit all of our budgeted numbers for October, which is great, with the exception of the administrative expenses, which was lower. And that's a good situation to have that drove down our administrative expenses, uh, that, sorry, that drove down our overhead rate to 115%, uh, which is a good thing. And it drove down our cumulative overhead rate to 122%, which is even better. That gets us under our year-to-date target of 123%. So overall, uh, that's very good news, particularly in the context of uh, COVID. I, I just want to point out, and maybe Mark and Rebecca will speak to this more, but the conservative budgeting uh, in the beginning of this process and the uncertainties ahead have meant uh, that we're actually looking pretty solid. And uh, I think Mark may speak to the overall uh, state's budget coming up, uh, but that's good. I had a brief check-in with Sheila before this and she was busy cutting checks from some Department of Public Health money that's going out to cities and towns uh, across our region. She's pointing out that that's the role that MAC MAPC plays. It's, it's a crucial ingredient in helping smaller communities that don't have the resources and the capacity to address the issues that we were just talking around about COVID, around openings, around closings, and all the many, many issues. Um, with that, that concludes my treasurer's report. I'd entertain any questions, comments, thoughts, et cetera. Does anybody have any questions for Sam? Uh, Sam, just as a, a historical perspective, um, you know, typically in the winter, we run into a, you know, depending on year to year, uh, snow days uh, as an issue because uh, uh, that's the January, February, uh, uh, part of the January, February, and, and some vacations uh, that affect the overhead rate considerably. And, you know, with uh, everybody working remotely, presumably the snow days uh, won't be uh, much of an effect, assuming everybody doesn't lose power. Is, does Sheila think that's going to make much of a difference uh, on, on the bottom line? Because it seems to 
you know, March, April, May, then we're catch, playing catch up to uh, take care of the higher numbers for the winter uh, year end. It used to be the calendar and a few other things that were expensive uh, administratively. But I, I don't know if you've had any chance to talk to Sheila about that and if that's going to make any difference uh, over the long run. Well, I, I, good, good question, Tabor, and thanks for, thanks for raising it. W one thing that Sheila did point out to me is that there was an expense that shows up in this of about uh, $12,000 which was helping people, helping the, the agency set up for remote work. And I, I expect like you, that that capacity now means that whether it's snowing outside people or having trouble getting around is less important for the day-to-day -day operations of the organization. We didn't speak about it directly. Uh, she did point out that uh, this next month coming, the month we're in right now, December, is both a holiday month, which is similar in some ways to a snow day month, uh, but also everybody is cranking, as she pointed out, to get through the DLTA money uh, so that they can finish out the year strong. So uh, my expectation is that December will look OK, uh, balancing out the DLTA spending with the days off that people are taking. And it's a guess, but and we can talk to Sheila more about this, but uh, We'll, we'll be able to manage the the snow and the bad weather in the in the in the winter months as well. Would be my guess. Uh, with that, Adam, can I hand it back to you for a, for a motion to accept the treasurer's report? Sure. Is there a motion uh, to accept? So moved. Second. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further comments, questions, concerns? Seeing none, thank you very much, Sam. I will once again call the roll here on acceptance of the treasurer's report. Sharonda? Aye. Keith? Aye. Karen? Aye. Adam, I vote in the affirmative. Uh, Tom? Aye. John DePriest? Aye. Yolanda? Aye. Sandra? Yes. Mo? I sorry. It's okay. Thank you. Uh, Jared? Aye. Tabor? Aye. Uh, Courtney? Aye. Thank you. Jenny? Uh, I'm on an MPA executive committee meeting, but I Aye. turned off my video to talk to you. Vandana? Aye. Sam? Aye. And I just, and I didn't mute, so everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lauren? Aye. Mayor Spicer? Aye. Elaine? Aye. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Motion passes. Okay. Adam, could I ask who made the motion and who seconded that? Uh, Karen made the motion. Okay. And it was seconded by a I choir. seconded it one. There were two seconds, I think, though. Okay. Yeah, it was the other Thank one, you, but go for it, John. I, John second, seconded. I seconded as well. Okay. Thank you. All right, with that, we will move to the report of the executive director and I will turn it over to Mark. Mark, we can't hear you. Mark, yeah, we can't hear you, Mark. Mark, if, if your microphone isn't working, sometimes uh, clicking on the up arrow and uh, testing out your speakers helps restart them. Uh, this happens on my Zoom a lot, so in case that's helpful for you. Still can't hear you. You can always call in, of course. Well, while you're getting the volume, I'll apologize for putting you guys <laughs> on hold while I took my boss's call. <laughs> That's okay. We've, we, I think we, we've probably all done it once oh in the past God, yeah. nine months. 
Lisa didn't say, oh my God, I'm on this horrible meeting. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Mark has asked if we could just move on to the next item while he works out his um, uh, speaker or microphone issues. Great. All right. So why don't we move on to the report of the legislative committee uh, where we're going to highlight the state legislative priorities for this upcoming session. Uh, so Keith, are you going to lead uh, this or are we turning this over to Liz? Yes, I, I, can, I can start off uh, by... <clears throat> thanking the uh, uh, government affairs uh, team for uh, the great uh, briefing that they gave the legislative committee uh, last uh, Wednesday and uh, uh, rightfully earned unanimous uh, support uh, from that uh, committee, uh, uh, recommending to the executive committee the materials that you have uh, before you today, specifically uh, in the uh, memorandum on uh, state legislative uh, priorities for 2021-2022. And so I will uh, turn that over to Lizzie. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. Um, so you have two documents that we sent out um, that we're going to be talking a little bit about. We're going to focus primarily on the new priorities document because that is the one um, that we actually need a vote on today and the older priorities, sort of ongoing priorities document uh, really gives an overview of those items on which we've taken a position in the past. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but I uh, just wanna flag that that document is kind of in an ongoing state of affairs. Um, I just wanna take a second and note that, you know, usually between the end of the legislative session and now my team and I have just, a ton of conversations with folks across the region, advocacy allies, internal conversations with directors at MAPC, all of our subregions, um, some folks that we don't work with that often to really kind of get a strong sense of what it feels like our legislative priorities should be for the upcoming session. Um, this legislative session continues, however, and so the team and I um, have had a number of those conversations to really inform what our legislative priorities should be. Um, but I think it's safe to say that it's actually a lot harder to prioritize what we should be thinking about for next legislative session while this session remains ongoing slash unending. Um, we have decided that we will be, um, or you know, hoping with your approval to really pursue legislative priorities that help advance us in terms of equity and recovery. Those are really the two frames that we are thinking about for our legislative priorities for next legislative session. It feels like that is what the moment is calling for. Um, and I do think that'll mean that we um, will, as we always do, be bringing back priorities that we aren't necessarily the first drafter on um, for your approval later as the session continues. That said, I do think that there will be opportunities as the legislature starts to consider state level recovery priorities um, where we might actually be taking a, a leading role. And so obviously, again, we will be bringing those back to you for approval when they come up. Um, I believe you all have the documents that were sent out. And so what the team and I are going to do is kind of go through them, give a very high level overview of what those priorities look like and a little bit of our rationale for why we've put them on our list. And again, these are all the new things that we're gonna be or somewhat new things that we're gonna be pursuing this year and taking a lead on at the agency. Um, since Leah has really helped to lead this process for the team, I'm gonna turn it over to her. I think she has the, the first issue to discuss with you. Awesome, good morning, everybody. Um, building decarbonization is an area that we've been spending a lot of time on with our clean energy team, really looking at opportunities um, to look at new construction going in the ground now and also looking at retrofits. Um, we're gonna need to be addressing both is what our data is showing in order to reach our climate goals for net zero by 2050 um, or 80% as is currently the goal on the Global Warming Solutions Act. We'll see what the legislature does in the coming weeks. Um, and um, so to, to look at that, we're, we're proposing to um, update the stretch code, update our building code for new buildings um, so that we are looking at net zero construction and also providing some incentives for those buildings that need deep energy retrofits, those buildings that are already in the ground um, to, to create 
more opportunities for those buildings to get retrofitted. Um, so it's sort of a dual approach. Um, we're working with um, a number of different advocacy organizations to, to pull this together um, and build off of some of our continuing work with um, the Board of Building Regulations and Standards, the BBRS at Overseas Code. Um, we've been working for a long time to sort of push that body um, to update the code and sort of bringing it to the legislature to put some timelines for when, when those updates need to be happening by is sort of our next proposed step. So that's it in a very brief nutshell. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on this topic at the legislative committee meeting and talking about how we can bring in um, some of the housing community to this work and some of the construction and trade groups to really talk about these opportunities for increased jobs and economic development. Um, so really talking about it, not just as a climate goal, but sort of as fitting in with our wider um, initiatives within the agency for where we want to go for 2050. I'll, I'll pause there. Great. I think we're happy to take questions if folks have them as we go, just because the topics are a little bit different from each other. Um, so I just want to pause and see if anyone has any questions about this. I think Buzz has his hand up. Um, thanks. Really quickly. Um, it, are we doing anything with respect to Boston's initiative in this? I did just listen to Chris Cook this morning uh, talk about what he's doing about a, a city, not a city building code, but a, a city code for, uh, for net zero uh, that he'll impose on all buildings of more than 20,000 square feet. Um, is this something that we can blend into what we're doing? Yeah, we're, we are pushing for a net zero code statewide. Um, so it's a statewide push and in part because of the way that the building code legislation is set up in Massachusetts, outside of Boston communities do not have control over their local code. They can only act under the statewide building code. And so that's why statewide action is so important in this arena. So uh, my, my only comment would be that, that um, the building code of course only works on new buildings or buildings substantially renovated. And what the city's work is doing uh, will involve a program to retrofit existing buildings. And since that isn't governed by the state building code, I wonder if that's an opportunity for cities like Framingham, for example, um, to, uh, to think about having that as their own initiatives and what our role might be in helping them do that. Yeah, and I'd say most of that work, you know, takes place through our clean energy team, through the local technical assistance, net zero planning that they work on, as well as the role that we have serving, serving on the Energy Efficiency and Advisory Council, which oversees the Mass Save program, the major source for retrofits um, in the Commonwealth. And Cami Peterson sits on that body and is also the co-chair of the equity subcommittee there. So it's not we don't, maybe we can have a presentation, I think, later about our building's work. A lot of that is happening on the ground level or through regulatory processes. And this is our attempt to kind of make some statutory changes as well that are necessary. Will there be any uh, coordination with uh, or uh, assimilation of neighboring codes? And I speak specifically toward New Hampshire, but, um, you know, anybody up on the North Shore that is uh, building or renovating uh, on the border, uh, here's the stories of how much cheaper it is to do things just six miles up the road. Uh, Rhode Island isn't the, quite the same, or or is Connecticut, but uh, you know certainly uh, now that we are a uh, uh, less regional and more of a national uh, a, you know, grouping of uh, distributors, manufacturers, and everything else, uh, the cost of construction in Massachusetts is significant. It's uh, at the very top. Uh, you know we're right up there with California. And it's, uh, it's, it's tough. California has got a huge uh, uh, area to, to expand or to uh, uh, capti captivate their population, whereas Massachusetts doesn't. And many of the companies that are in Mass can easily go just over the line and uh, you know, you take advantage of some of those. And, and the building code is certainly one of them. And I don't know how, if there's anything on the federal level that can affect that and or is there any coordination with uh, something like that. Well, I, I guess two points is, you know, I would say that a lot of those costs have to do with our high land cost as well as our restrictive zoning laws, which often increase the cost of uh, building. So, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say our code is the primary driver. We adopt the international energy code. Um, so, you know, we're coordinating not only, you know, across other states that adopt it, 
but I, I can't control what New Hampshire adopts, but also, you know, with code internationally. And I think if you'll remember, we've been doing a ton of work actually getting cities and towns to help vote on that international code and really kind of affect what that looks like um, for all of the different jurisdictions that decide to use that as their base code. Other questions on the building electrification piece? I'm just wondering if people can hear me. We yeah. got you, Mark, loud and clear. Thank you, I have no questions on building electrification, but sorry about that. All Great, right. thank you guys so much. Excellent. Thank you, Leah. Um, so Adam, if it's all right with you, I think we'll move on. Go ahead. Yep. Um, and I am going to turn this over to Kasha Hart on the government affairs team to talk about the next item. Great. Uh, thanks, Lizzie. So this next item would essentially direct MassDOT and the MBTA to conduct a cost assessment in order to determine how much it would cost to make our transportation system climate resilient. Um, so continuing on, on the climate theme, and we know that you know we're not going to be able to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions to the levels needed if our transportation system isn't resilient to the threats of climate change. And that number, how much it would cost to make our, our system resilient to climate change is currently unknown. Right now, um, climate resiliency efforts kind of happen on a more, more piecemeal basis. And you know, the, the, resili the infrastructure that's currently experiencing the threats to, to climate change, that's what's being prioritized for resiliency investments. So we wanna get ahead and um, have MassDOT and the T conduct this cost assessment. And the goal would really be, you know, to get a sense of what that number is, and then ensure that um, there's some sort of prioritization plan developed so that the infrastructure that's most, you know, most needed for improvements or, or retrofits, what have you, is front loaded in our capital, our capital plan. Um, I think that's it. Um, Lizzie, jump in if I've missed anything and happy to take any questions too. Any questions for Kasha? All right, looks like none. I think you can, I, oh, go ahead, one, Karen. one question, Adam. I, I'm just, um, Kasha, has this, there wasn't anything filed this session about on this, was there? I can't recall. I don't believe so, no. Yeah, it's a new sort of, I, it, there's a lot to digest in that. Um, great, thanks. Yeah, it is, it is a new idea. And honestly, I can say, it was really born out of a lot, a lot of the conversations that we were having with an, a number of other advocacy allies where everyone was trying to kind of do this cost assessment where if we were gonna raise money for the tea, how much would we need? And it was, we were all sort of a little bit shooting in the dark. So we thought, it, you know, if we could kind of create an assessment requirement and then, you know, sort of add on an action plan, we, we might actually get there. <laughs> Um, all right, great. So it looks like we're ready to move on to the next item. This is obviously not a new piece of legislation for MAPC to file. We've been um, looking at regional ballot initiatives and we've filed legislation on this. I think this will be the um, ninth year because <laughs> um, it's just about as old as my oldest daughter. Um, so what we, our biggest challenge around regional ballot initiatives, and it is worth noting that this item is still somewhat in the mix in the transportation bills that are moving inside the state house. Um, but uh, we've obviously had a, a much harder time passing the legislation in the house. Um, although the Senate has now passed it, I think it'll be the third time. Um, so, but our challenge has really been around the house. And so after talking with our house sponsor, that's Rep. Adrian Madero, um, we've thought about actually changing some of the taxation mechanisms that we would include in the regional ballot initiatives bill to have, make them have a slightly closer and tighter nexus um, to transportation revenue sources themselves. Um, it's, it's one of the criticisms that the bill has had out there. And so we thought, well, let's, let's add this into the mix and see if that helps um, change things. It will not be a significant change. And I um, expect that we will file the version we have filed on the Senate side again with Senator Lesser. Um, but we, we wanted to flag this for you because it is a bit of a, of a change from what we've done in years past. Happy to, yes, I see your hand, Sandra. 
Um, thanks. So is the issue in the house just the aversion to new taxes generally? Um, I mean, part of it is what you said. It wasn't necessarily totally connected to transportation related house uh, taxes, but is, can you say a little bit more about what the barrier is? Sure. You know, and Mark might have some things to add here too. I think, um, you know, the biggest challenge around this is that the house has proposed, um, Chairman Strauss in particular has proposed a value capture mechanism for raising local transportation revenue. And I should be very clear that we have supported that low these many years as well. And I think that the two branches just have different ideas about how we raise that local money. And I think Chairman Strauss quite honestly wants to see his proposal move first. We have always, again, been supportive of having as many local transportation revenue raising options out there as possible. And I will note part of our advocacy um, this session, I anticipate, is that we'll be pushing the fact that I think some of these local revenue raising options will be critically important during recovery. Um, just if we learned anything from our communities and counties, honestly, that were able to put a little bit of skin in the game, we're just better able to take advantage of the federal dollars that came down. It would not surprise me if Congress put in some of those same requirements around any other infrastructure bill. Um, so we would like to see both of those things pass. But I, I, I feel like, you know, that that is the bulk of the opposition in the House. Chairman Strauss has also raised concerns around the equity opportunities of regional ballot initiatives. That they, it is more likely that a wealthier community would raise regional, raise local taxes. Um, you know, it's actually also the case that around the, it's a, it's a valid criticism of the value capture mechanism as well, that if you have a project, it is often happening in a community where the, you know, if you're moving a transportation project, there's often a development project along the same lines. Mark, what else do you yeah. want to add? Yeah, I would, um, <clears throat> I would say probably the greatest difficulty that we have in the House, uh, Sandra, is that the Senate likes the bill. Um, that's always, you know, I mean, Jarty Whip sat me down when I was there and said, you got to remember, the governor is not the enemy. The Republicans are not the enemy. The Senate is the enemy. So uh, and I think it applies in the other direction as well. Um, I think that the opposition to new taxes is also part of it and a longstanding opposition to giving municipalities more control over their own budget. Um, those things add up to be, you know, substantial barriers. Um, the. Uh, the so-called equity criticism that, that um, regional ballot initiatives might raise more in richer parts of the state and less in other parts of the state is I think, I, I think not an accurate criticism because we do have evidence throughout the country of less wealthy areas utilizing this system. Uh, it is also possible for a core city that is not particularly wealthy and a series of suburbs that are a little better off to get together and have a regional ballot initiative that they all contribute to. And if we take some of the pressure off state funding uh, by passing a regional ballot initiative in a wealthier area, well, then there's more money for other parts of the state that the state distributes from, from among the regular revenues, federal and state that the state distributes. So, um, you know, I, I, I tend not to think that the fact that these revenues are not directly related to transportation is as serious a problem. But if our chief sponsor thinks it might give us a leg up to see if we can move it in the house, then I think we would be willing to try. The greatest difficulty we have to address is that if you increase the property tax or the sales tax, you can generate a substantial amount of money. If you increase some of these transportation related taxes, you don't necessarily raise as much money. So it might become somewhat less uh, remunerative. But as Lizzie says, we've been trying for a long time Trying the same thing again and again and again and expecting a different result is, as we all know, a definition of insanity. So it might be worthwhile to give something new a try. And that's what we're, what we're looking into here. Great. It looks like we're ready to move on. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Leah to talk about the open meeting law and town meeting pieces. Um, thanks, Lizzie. So one of the things that um, we've been doing throughout this fall is meeting with each of the subregions um, in the MAPC area to hear about some of the challenges that they're facing and um, opportunities going forward. And consistently, we heard that people were um, utilizing the ability um, allowed under statute during COVID to hold their meetings remotely and count quorum remotely over Zoom. And folks were interested in having that ability going forward after a pandemic. Um, 
So we're looking um, to, to, fi to file or work with um, other organizations to, to make that possible. Um, and there's also some interest in looking at um, what the future of town meetings might be, either um, held remotely, um, which is currently allowed for representative town meeting, and open town meeting, which currently um, during the pandemic has been allowed to, to reduce their quorum size. Um, so particularly around um, open meeting law, um, we've heard a lot of interest. So we're, we're working um, with, with other groups to, to see what we can do uh, going forward. Question? Good, Karen. Um, are you going to be looking at any at, at possible mechanisms for open town meeting as well? Because that's complicated and certainly um, could be beneficial. Um, yeah, I think this is great. I, I know that in um, my community, having Zoom meetings has actually increased public engagement because it's just easier um, yeah. than having to sit in a conference room. So good, great initiative. Wonderful, yeah, we have a conversation coming up with the current chairs of the municipalities committee to sort of bring in some local voices to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities with the statute as it's currently drafted and what, what might be needed for next session. Aaron, I think I'm responding to your point. Generally speaking, we believe that we should continue to expand the opportunities for virtual participation. And again, generally speaking, there may be some exceptions. Uh, we feel that um, many of the changes that have become possible during the pandemic in terms of virtual engagement should remain tools of public bodies going forward. Uh, I think on either of those two points, there are certain circumstances where maybe that general rule does not apply. But generally speaking, we think that there have been some salutary changes and um, communities should continue to be allowed to exercise them. Terrific, thanks. Mo has a question. Oh. Yeah, it's one of the barriers we've had in trying to um, figure out how to do virtual town meetings is what to do about some of the technologically challenged town meeting members and ways to get them assistance. Has there been much discussion about that? Very much so. Um, you know, we've been working really closely with the um, community engagement team that's been running and supporting some of the town meetings um, in the region and talking about the kinds of trainings that they offered, um, sort of webinar style and some of the one on one outreach that was needed to really help everyone feel comfortable with the technology. Um, and, and definitely thinking about that uh, as part of what gets built in. Um, some of that's not necessarily what you would want to put in statute, right. um, but you'd want to build that into programs and working with communities and, and how that gets accomplished. Thank you. Our community engagement team is not only, they've ran both Stoughton and Dedham's town meeting, but have been listening and, you know, really seeing what folks are doing. And I, I think as we move forward, what, one of the options we also want to make available is thinking about hybrid meetings and hearing about a lot of desire about communities that are interested in still allowing for virtual participation while having some folks being able to participate in person. So I, I think this will be ever evolving both practice of work and you know, hopefully some changes that can allow for that to continue at the, at the legislative level. And Mo, if we're not helping Needham already, you let us know, be in touch with any of us. And I know Emily and her team would be glad to help. I really appreciate that because we're, we're agonizing over how to do this going forward. And I, one of the things that's helped us is we do our presentations now uh, before the meeting on video, which has made the meetings run a lot smoother. We've been doing it in person, but the presentations all take place before the meeting, which helps a lot. So thank you very much. Sure. It's also a good flag, Mo. You know, one of the things that's challenging about this particular piece of legislation is we don't want to legislate technology that ends up getting outdated. <laughs> um, so our, our data team has kind of cautioned us to make sure that we leave room and flexibility for whatever um, virtual participation might come down the line, right? Like three years ago, we couldn't have imagined we'd have meetings like this, but here we are. Any other questions about this piece? Great. 
Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Diego to talk about the next item. This, again, is also not a, a totally new piece, um, but I, we are going to be taking a, a bigger leading role on this, this legislative session. And I, I expect Mark will have some things to add after Diego kicks us off as well. Yep. Thanks, Lizzie. Um, and again, it's the HERO um, legislation is something that we've already supported in the past. And the reason, one of the reasons we're going to prioritize this going forward is because it is a, re a significant revenue um, bill. So if you remember back in January of 2019, the governor um, rolled out S10, which would have increased the excise fees on um, real estate, real estate trans transactions, um, with that money being dedicated to um, climate mitigation adaptation work. Um, so, a, a, you know, afterwards, a group of housing and environmental advocates got together and proposed doubling um, the governor's increase. Um, and still keeping half of that new revenue for the climate issue and then another half for affordable housing. Um, and so what that would actually translate into is $300 million of new revenue annually, 150 of that, again, going to climate um, issues and the other going to affordable housing. Um, within the housing, you know, half of that would go to um, housing stability and the other half would go to actual housing, like affordable housing and, and production. Um, Again, that all would be new revenue. Um, the funds would go to existing um, existing state funds, so we're not creating anything new. Um, and that's kind of like just a really quick um, summary of, of what the hero hero um, legislation would be. Turning it over to Mark, see if I've missed anything. No, Diego hasn't missed anything. I mean, our goal here is to try and provide what I think would be about $150 million a year for each of the two uh, uses, about $150 million for housing, which would be pretty evenly distributed between uh, production and, well, it's, it's distributed between two trust funds that currently exist, one of which is used for production and preservation, and the other one of which can be used for either production, preservation, or rental assistance. Uh, so we want to have a system in there, particularly in light of the COVID pandemic, where some of the money can be used for rental support, but most of it over the long term would probably go to production activities. And in the climate field, Leia has been leading us in the very good fight to try and make sure that the money is available for both mitigation and adaptation. We love them both, even though we can occasionally get into sort of battles within the community about the primacy of one or the other. Um, so 150 million for housing, 150 million for climate, uh, we didn't actually expect this would be filed this year. Senator Eldridge and Representative Elugardo kind of insisted on filing it this year. It starts the conversation, but this is really a next year item. The coalition is big that is supporting of this. That, that makes it a little bit squirrely. There's a lot of people at the table, but uh, we're trying to keep everybody happy and uh, trying to keep everybody focused on this, this good new revenue option, which would still leave us lower on our uh, deeds excise fee than most New England states. And still it constitutes a cost that people generally will pay two, three, four times in their lives, not every year. Any questions about the HERO Act? Great. No, nope, does not look like there is, okay. All right, so I'm gonna turn it back to Diego to talk about the next, um, and I think it's the final item uh, on our list. Um, and I, again, you know, I will just note, um, Mark sent out a, a really um, excellent summary that Diego and Mark Fine worked on. Uh, they've done a lot of work on the legislation as it was moving this session. It is not over because the governor sent back the legislation um, with some vetoes and we are we are still figuring out how we might consider weighing in on those pieces. Um, but we wanted to raise this um, and I feel like we might have actually written the first draft of this even before <laughs> the bill came out um, and they voted on something. But we do feel like this is going to be an ongoing priority for, for the agency looking ahead. And so we wanted to make sure to add it to our list. So Diego, yeah, you're And again, I, I won't get into um, what was in the bill because I, I, th that, that's what the summary, hopefully I ever had a chance to read the summary. I'm happy to go over that if people do have questions about it. But <clears throat> in terms of what we're going to be looking at next session, the two items that weren't missed that were missing in the police reform bill are around um, civil service reform and arbitration. Um, 
on civil service reform, MAPC has done research on kind of municipal workforce, which includes law enforcement, um, really speaking to how civil service is really a barrier to diversifying the municipal workforce. Um, within the bill, there is a commission that they, they create a commission to look at civil service reform and and then make recommendations to the legislature to the legislature on what you know how to change it. Um, so we'll definitely be um, kind of monitoring monitoring who is appointed to the commission and kind of working with them to make sure they have our research and kind of our our viewpoints on where we stand on that um, and really kind of work with them just to kind of see what recommendations come out. Um, and then on the you know arbitration and collective bargaining agreement. Um, Again, there's no there's no real policy changes in the current form of the bill. Again, the commission to look at civil service reform. One of the areas they look at, one of the areas they're going to be studying is around arbitration and collective bargaining. So um, those are kind of like the TBD pieces that will kind of, um, you know, be working with the legislature on next session. Um, that's kind of all I have on the police reform bill. And obviously, you know, this is still a little fluid because. Um, like Lizzie mentioned, we'll, we have to see kind of what is in the final version of the police reform bill overall. Um, I think we're pretty supportive of a lot of important aspects of it, but again, TBD kind of what, where, it, where, the, where it ends up. So I, I would chime in to say thank you all for, for this follow-up legislation. I, I'm, I'm hoping that part of this is because you've heard my uh, complaining over the past several months that uh, you know, I, I think the reform that has been passed and has now been sent back to the legislature does a lot of good, but contains a Trojan horse, potentially. Uh, that might be a bad metaphor, but of thinking that an officer is decertified means they're no longer employed by the municipality when collective bargaining agreements in their arbitration provisions could mean that the person could no longer be a police officer, but still have to maintain their employment with the municipality, which obviously is... You know, problematic on multiple layers. So, uh, I I fully support it. And thank they'll you. all be sent to the planning department. I'm absolutely yeah, exactly, sure. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and and, and then they'll be on the MAPC executive committee. Yeah. Um, so thank you. I, I'm 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 really appreciative of this work. Yeah, and I would just add, Adam. Um, you know, that that's a really good point. There, you know, the bill is is I think intentionally ambiguous about what that would mean, and so I wouldn't be surprised if you know, next year there there'd be just like legal challenges as to, to kind of clarify like what this means. But um, yes, thank you for raising those issues. Sam, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just, I just want to make a more, just the general comment of thank you for staying on this. I, I imagine that actually moving some of these more difficult things will take a, a continued push and, and focus uh, by groups like MAPC and other groups and uh, so I just appreciate you you keeping it on our radars. I do appreciate it. Thanks. Great. Um, so those again are all the items that we are hoping. Sorry, Lizzie. I think I think I saw Jenny raise hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Jenny. I didn't mean to do that. That's okay. I was sort of waving before. Um, uh, I just wanted to appreciate the work of the legislative team and these uh, all of the new additions to your legislative priorities, which I think are excellent. Um, I want to underscore a couple of them that I think are very important. The first one um, being uh, building decarbonization and building code. Um, I think that that is really critical to a lot of the net zero planning that I'm seeing happening in local communities. Um, it's very important that we address that particular issue and I'm very much in support of that. Um, the second one is around um, open meeting law reforms and town meetings of any type. Um, definitely agree that that's very important. Yes, there's been increased participation and we want that to continue and we want to be able to broaden access. Um, but I do agree that there should be some thoughtfulness around how that's done and also tying to a slight discussion around broadband um, which I think is also critical when you're talking about this being statewide. Um, and then just lastly to say that I also am glad to see HERO continuing uh, discussions. I, I guess the only question I have about this one is I thought there was a third. <laughs> um, wasn't there, like, weren't there three items that were supposed to be part of this and not just housing and climate? Was there a third item? Like I transportation perhaps? I think no, so there's, there, go ahead, Rebecca. Oh, is that originally it was housing and then it was climate mitigation and adaptation. 
but the decision was to move it to the Global Warming Solutions Trust Fund, which actually is available for both. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying. I thought I remembered a third. Okay. It was climate mitigation, adaptation, and housing, and we just kind of put them together in a fund where, where they have the ability to spend on both. Okay. Thank you. And thank you again for the work. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. And Jenny, I would just add on, on the broadband piece that if, if folks haven't seen uh, data serve or one of our maps of the month was on broadband access and it's really, um, well, I'm, I'm so I know we talked about the calendar and the cost before, but this one more than others has really generated a great conversation at the local level. Many cities and towns have actually had hearings um, on this issue after looking at the map and kind of seeing the low levels of uh, broadband speed, particularly in some of our more urban communities. And we've already had requests from meetings from Verizon and Comcast um, on this issue. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. And I know that our um, economic development team together with our digital services team is coming up with a plan for work that we can do to really address some of the digital divide issues that have been so highlighted by the pandemic. So more to come there. Great. Adam, maybe I could um, ask you to get a motion on this in a second, and um, I might have one final comment to make broadly uh, before the vote, if that's okay with you. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, why don't, why don't we do that? So we're looking for a motion to endorse this uh, slate of priorities. So moved. Second. All right, motion made by Jenny Raitt, seconded by Mo Handel. Any further comment? Mark, do you wanna make your comment now before the vote? Yeah, sure. Please. Um, I, I'm sorry, I missed the beginning of, of Lizzie's presentation during my technical breakdown here. But um, so I, I apologize if she or Rebecca has already said these things. But I, I do want to really commend the entire legislative team, the government affairs staff under Lizzie's leadership, Diego, Kasha and Leah. Uh, their work over the course of the last 10 months has been absolutely exemplary. They have been leaders in addressing the twin crises in our society over that period of time and everything else, none of which went away, I wanna be clear. Um, you know, This legislative session, when it was extended on July 31st, I think there was first a hope that they would finish everything up in a couple of weeks. And there was a hope that they do it right after Labor Day. Now we're just hoping they get it done before the next session. <laughs> there were five big items, the budget, police violence, the economic development bill, the transportation bond bill, and the climate bill. And people should realize, I know Karen and others on this call realize, only two of those things have really moved so far and they're not done. And healthcare, sorry. <laughs> um, and you know those other things are still all in conference. And it's likely the legislative team is gonna be, I wouldn't be surprised working right up to the 3rd of January, the 5th of January, or whatever the day is that they get sworn in and, um, and continuing to follow these items and trying to make them as strong as they can. And in the meantime, they've been attempting to generate next year's priorities during a time when speaking to other people and having the usual discussions was very, very challenging, uh, but they've managed to do it I know that um, a draft document has been circulated to you as well on existing priorities that are all still on the table for us. You don't have to vote on or discuss that today, but it, is, it has been made available to you. And the team at the same time is working on two other separate pieces, one on revenue and one on an equitable economic recovery after COVID. Uh, and those two, doc those two documents will be coming to you January or February for your consideration as well. So, um, and, you know, and Diego and his wife Hazel had a baby, a baby in the middle of all of this yeah. too, which took a little of his time, but also seriously meant that we were down one key person for about five weeks. So I just want to, um, if I could hug them all on the call, I would. They're, they just did a fabulous job. They're doing a fabulous job. And I, I want to really just give my thanks and admiration and hope you will all share that. Thank you, Mark. How you can vote. 
Well, de definitely. Uh, th thank you for saying that. And I, I think I can speak for the group in sharing that tremendous thanks and admiration. Very, 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 very well deserved. So with that, I will, I'll call the roll. Uh, try to remember everybody who's here and not here. Um, Sharonda? Aye. Keith? Aye. Karen? Aye. Adam, I vote in the affirmative. Uh, Tom? Aye. John DePriest? Aye. I believe Yolanda has left. Sandra? Yes. Mo? Yes. Jared? Aye. Tabor? Yes. George? Yes. Thank you, George. Courtney? Abstain. Jenny? Yes. Vandana? Abstain. Sam? Yes. Lauren? Do we have Lauren? All right, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped over Steve Olenoff. He's joined Steve? Yes. Mayor Spicer? Okay, and Elaine? Abstain. Okay, motion passes. Uh, quickly before we move on to the next uh, agenda item, uh, Lizzie had one more comment to make. Thanks, Adam, and thank you all so much for your vote. It's really excellent to hear the support. Um, I did just wanna uh, echo what Mark said about our recovery priorities. That is a big focus of the team as we kind of think about what is gonna be moving next legislative session. And um, it is an interesting thing, but we are borrowing ahead from a lot of the ideas that were put out there in um, that are being drafted on the policy priorities around Metro Common and Kasha is taking a really big role in helping us lead that effort inside the government affairs team. Um, but we will be bringing back a, a document that has um, a number of what we think are really interesting recovery ideas. And they might not be things that we file legislation on, but we will be using them to help advance the conversation inside the state house. And so I just wanted to give you a heads up to stay tuned for that effort. And then once again, just thank my amazing colleagues. It is a very good thing that we are friends because I think we're gonna be spending a lot of Christmas and New Year's together this year. <laughs> Thanks, Adam. Great. Thank you, Lizzie. All right, so why don't we turn it now to Mark for the executive director's report. Thank you very much, everybody. And I have the, um, I now have the document up in front of me. So hopefully I'll be able to go through it. It was sent to you all this morning. So if you wanna go through it, you can as well. Um, I'll try and mention, I think, um, I'll try and stick with one item from each department if I possibly can. And, and the first one up, is arts and culture. Uh, and I'm gonna actually draw attention to a project that I haven't discussed previously and that I think is new to this, this report, which is the Somerville Arts Space Risk Assessment. I don't know, I, I don't remember if George Proakis is on the phone. I think he is. George, are uh, you there? I am here, yes. Yeah. This is a project we're trying to do with the city of Somerville, but also with benefit and participation for other communities as well because it's a really important issue in terms of the tremendous stresses on arts and cultural organizations during the current pandemic. And that is whether or not they will be able to keep and maintain the spaces in which they operate. Uh, many of them are not in those spaces now, but are hoping and expecting to return to those spaces at some time. And we're trying to indicate or to identify what the criteria and indicators are to identify risk for the loss of those spaces to determine whether an artist's income, race, or tenure in their career affects their access to existing spaces and what municipal programs or policies might help to support the resiliency of art spaces facing displacement. Uh, it's a little bit of a different twist on how we're trying to help arts organizations survive the pandemic. I think the information is going to be very valuable to municipalities and to artists alike. So I just wanted to draw attention to that work if I could. Under clean energy, um, they continue a tremendous amount of work on the net zero building code, on net zero plans for individual communities, you know, all in the absence of the kind of real change on the state level that we need in terms of our codes. Uh, nonetheless, the clean energy team is working with multiple communities on all of these efforts. And uh, one community that is highlighted here in this particular 
uh, section is the work we're doing on climate vision for Marblehead, which is a particularly at-risk community because of its location, everybody knows. There was no section on communications in the last ED report, which is very unusual. Amanda almost always gets that in. So it's a slightly longer section this time with a tremendous number of links. And I think the links themselves indicate, um, uh, you know, really how much work the, um, the communications team has been doing. And I feel that uh, sometimes this is underappreciated. There's almost, almost every project we work on, certainly every public presentation or webinar that we've been doing, multiple departments contribute to that, but communications is always involved. Amanda, Karen, Kit, and Elise are tremendously involved in keeping us public facing during this time when we can't actually see anyone. And I wanna particularly draw attention to some of the work that they've done and, and many of which are listed in that, still a relatively short section uh, on page four of the report. In data, I think hands down, the item I have to mention is the zoning atlas. Uh, we have been working on a comprehensive uh, analysis and presentation of zoning in every community throughout the region for the past nine years. It was one of the so-called 10 most wanted data sets that we published when we adopted the Metro Future Plan. And when it is completed and presented at a public uh, event, a virtual event, obviously tomorrow, it will represent the sixth of those 10 data sets that we have acquired and made available to the public. Uh, it is the first time since 1999 that there has been a comprehensive assessment of zoning uh, comparably across all municipalities. Uh, it was a Herculean task. Uh, it is a living document, so it can always be improved uh, as it lives online. It is not a printed version, even though I personally believe it would have made a fantastic coffee table book for this holiday season. Uh, it, it exists only digitally. Uh, but that means that municipalities and other interested parties can constantly update, improve, and frankly, correct the zoning atlas over time. And I think it's going to be an enormous, uh, an enormous benefit to the region. We are already planning a series of research projects based upon this data on a variety of subjects so that we will not only have the zoning in front of us, but we will be able to tell the public what the zoning means and uh, sort of how it compares, what are the general trends across communities? So a big kudos to uh, the data services team, past and present. There are plenty of people who aren't here anymore uh, who are in other jobs, but who contributed tremendously to this. I'm very much looking forward to tomorrow's event, an enormous amount of, of effort. In the environment, uh, department, I would uh, really draw attention to the work of Darcy Schofield, Rebecca and Cami were also deeply engaged in this. Uh, we have now reviewed grant applications received in October and selected 11 proposals for funding totaling $700,000 under our Accelerating Climate Resiliency Grant Program, which gives individual communities the ability to implement climate adaptation strategies. We have plenty of these adaptation strategies on the books at this point because of the planning that we, that the municipalities, that others have been doing, but very frequently not the money to implement them. And with tremendous support from the Barr Foundation and great leadership by Darcy Schofield from our environment team, we've been able to put that money out on the street. Um, sadly, uh, Darcy is leaving MAPC. She has a great new opportunity in her life and her career to become the leader of the National Park Equity Initiative for the National Park and Recreation Association. Uh, it's a nationwide um, platform for her. I know she's gonna keep MAPC in her heart and be a good strong member of the Alumni Association. And we're gonna keep her in our hearts as well. Uh, in the meantime, uh, she has really done a great job in uh, moving this program now through two funding cycles. The Bar Foundation gave us just about a week or two ago I think it was an additional $170,000 to get a few more projects funded that we couldn't originally fund. And I think it's a sign of their, their support for the program, which I expect is going to be long-term. 
not going to talk too much about government affairs um, right now because we've obviously gone through the legislative priorities. The budget is done. Our um, priorities in that budget were for the most part held firm through conference and also uh, avoided any vetoes from the governor. DLTA level funded, extraordinarily important for this agency. Also very important for Elaine, who's on the call today, who oversees that program. A slight increase actually in the Shannon funding, which we, we weren't expecting. We went into conference with 11 million from both branches. We thought we had it made in the shade and we had better than that. We came out with 11.3. And, um, and a substantial increase in a number of the housing line items as well, including for rental assistance. And that very important $10 million investment in local departments of public health, about an extra $17.5 million in funding that can get on the street very quickly through the Mass Growth Capital Corporation for small business support and assistance. So in a very difficult year, the budget was for us quite successful. And I know Lizzie didn't get a chance to talk about that too much during the presentation of legislative priorities, but very important to note. There's a very long list of land use projects right now. I'm not sure that I'm going to mention any specific one because there are a lot of great ones going on. I will instead make a general point, which is, you know, some of our projects go swimmingly and others are challenging. Sometimes they're challenging because there are folks in the community who are sort of opposed to the perspective that we and the community leadership are trying to bring to a, to a project. Sometimes they are constrained because communities are eager to move forward with the project, but don't want us to do the kind of community engagement that we want to do. Sometimes the project moves very well through advisory committee, but then runs into some public difficulties that make adoption by a planning board or a board of selectmen challenging. I want to note that I've had conversations just this week with the people working on the staff managing three of the specific projects that are on this list. And they've gone through with me the difficulties that they're facing. And we've brainstormed together ways of trying to kind of unlock the problems that they see there and move the projects forward. And I just, I want people to know that, you know, when we get a project with a city or town, we sign the contract, we get the funding. That's only the beginning. These projects usually end successfully, but there's a lot in between. And I just want to congratulate our staff for being so thoughtful about how to deal with that. Municipal collaboration. I want to draw some attention to the work of the Health and Medical Coordinating Coalition, Beth Roberts organization, which is part of MAPC now and managed under municipal collaboration. Uh, the surge has generated another onslaught of need, interest and inquiries that HMCC is dealing with 24 seven. I have congratulated and thanked them before, and I will do it again. In some ways, it's gonna be a long and challenging winter, and, uh, and they are at the forefront of helping us with that. In data, um, ben, ben Faust wanted to be here today, but we didn't have the, the time to put it on the agenda to go over the latest project inventory. There's a very good section about that and the project and in, we've included a few of the charts, the project inventory, which is our annual analysis of all the projects at MAPC, uh, you know, very frequently 100, 150 projects at any given point in time is our way of tracking their impact and their meaning for the region. And uh, I hope that Ben will be able to distribute that to you when it's finished, it's almost done and uh, maybe have a presentation early in the year. There's a bit of a, a taste about it. Uh, in the, um, in the executive director's report. Metro Common is moving ahead very smartly. I, I really think that this last period, these past three months have shown more pro progress in Metro Common kind of on a week by week basis than I have seen um, prior to this in terms of, uh, of public sessions that are being held on challenges and opportunities, scenario planning, completion of research tasks, a whole bunch of things are moving forward, not the least of which is the preparation of about 20 policy chapters, uh, many of which are close to done at this point, but others of which are starting up. And uh, I really feel that by June of next year, we will have Metro Common ready for adoption. 
Under community engagement, I want to um, congratulate the staff for the tremendous work on virtual town meetings, Stoughton and Dedham particularly. Please read those sections. Emily Torres Cullinane and her team also assisted by municipal collaboration, by IT, by operations and by comms has really created a niche for us in helping communities to do their town meetings and to do virtually other meetings upon which the towns and cities depend. Uh, and I got just tremendous thanks from the town of Dedham for the work that we did there. Public health and municipal collaboration are our two departments that are on the front line helping our cities and towns with COVID response. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more, I think in the next agenda item, there is an update on a lot of that uh, in the uh, sections that are in the, uh, at, toward the end of the executive director's report. And lastly, I'll close um, by talking a little bit about the work that our transportation department has done on the Alston I-90 multimodal project. Very difficult, very expensive, but extremely important project with tremendous regional implications. We have submitted two, I think, incredibly thoughtful comment letters uh, recently. Both of them have received a lot of attention on social media and in the press. Uh, I, I really want to thank Eric uh, Barassa and his team for all that work. Uh, although the decision on these projects has been postponed until next summer, a tremendous amount of work goes on behind the scenes to try and make the project good from the perspective of commuters, the perspective of uh, the Alston community, in Brookline and Cambridge, which are very close, and also from the perspective of people in Metro West who use the I-90 roadway to travel in and out of Boston. Hard to balance all of those, especially hard to balance them when you have to move all those roads and rails through what I think is, I don't know, is it 200 yards? It's, it's a very small uh, amount of space, but Eric and his team have been doing tremendous work on that. And I just wanted to highlight that today. Adam, I'm going to close there and we'll answer any questions if uh, people have them. Sandra. Thanks. So um, on the our Somerville Arch Risk Assessment, um, that sounds like something that's much needed statewide. And I wondered if there any thought had been given to that. It just, it's, it struck me that people talk about housing assistance and um, all kinds of stuff, but I haven't seen much at all on uh, arts uh, assistance. I mean, there's got to be just thousands and thousands of people in many different fields who are just barely hanging on and we're in danger of losing major major efforts in, in a lot of fields. And I just, um, I mean, you have the, the big institutions which will probably get by, but there are so many smaller entities and um, you know, maybe the small business assistance helps with some of that, but I just wondered, it just feels to me as though there hasn't been enough mentioned nationally, statewide or, or you know, and, and there's a little bit of local work, but not much um, in terms of really um, saving that sector. I well, mean, we have been trying to work on it. Um, the arts and culture department has really refocused a lot of their energies in that direction. This project is only one indication of that. Um, I wish I could tell you, Sandra, oh no, there's some other resource that you don't know about. I can't really. I mean, the reality is that a lot of artists are hand to mouth at this point in time. A lot of them don't qualify for um, unemployment assistance, even though obviously the new un newer unemployment assistance that is available to contractors or the self-employed has helped, but not entirely. Um, we also have to pay attention to the fact that, frankly, a sizable portion of our artistic community is undocumented and they are eligible for virtually nothing. Uh, it is a very, very difficult time for small artists, particularly in lower income communities. We are doing everything we can to not only be of help, but to raise the issue in all our conversations about small businesses and to try and make sure that they're included. But we are only one voice. And we need a lot more voices on that issue. Thank you, Marks. Sandra has her hand raised again. I, I do want to point out we have just over 10 minutes left and we haven't talked about uh, any of the COVID efforts left, uh, which it seems to me to be a pretty meaty agenda item. Uh, but maybe we Sandra, could, if people have additional questions, maybe they could just email me. I'd be glad to respond. I only wanted to say that I'm hoping that maybe MAPC would, be, would consider being a convener on bringing together a lot of people to work on that, but maybe that's already happening. Thank you. Well, we will certainly consider that, or if it's happening and I don't know, I'll find out. 
Yeah, I, I would just say, Mark, NFC is at the table with Bass Creative, who's kind of mm -hmm. spearheading some of the conversations around um, economic recovery for the creative sector. But I'll make sure to talk with Mark about including that in the director's report for the, the next meeting. Great. So, Mark, why don't, why don't we dive into the COVID-19 agenda? So I'm going to turn this over to Rebecca. I didn't alert her, but she's had this responsibility before. Talk about some of the agency-wide work that we've been doing on COVID. Sure. I think I'll, I'll focus on some of the immediate and then also talk about some of the kind of more medium-term planning that we've been doing. You know, so in the immediate, um, you know, with the rising surge, rising case counts and hospitalizations, uh, we have been convening municipal leaders and you know i i want to give a special shout out to mayor spicer and adam who have been on so many phone calls with us and really kind of bear the brunt of this you know and i, I can't count how many calls we've had over the last month or so you know trying to figure out the right strategy really trying to balance i think the really untenable position that our municipal leaders are in particularly with the so far lack of federal action um, on trying to balance kind of public health impacts with appropriate rollbacks and really trying to manage the effects that ha has on folks' livelihoods, or even right now, you know, the effects of the pandemic itself and the public health crisis is having, you know, folks feeling less comfortable to go out to eat or, you know, go out and shop. And so, you know, part of what we were involved with is, I think, the rollback announcement that you saw on Monday with the city of Boston, a number of other communities deciding to go back to phase 2.2, very engaged in helping to create a semi-regional response there, while at the same time really working to urge the governor to try and think about what other phase rollbacks are necessary, knowing that they'd be most effective at a statewide level to deal with some of that you know, community to community concern that we were talking about at the beginning of the meeting. At the same point, we're, we're pushing as hard as we can. And honestly, that's what Lizzie and I have spent the most of today working on, trying to get as much relief as possible available for our small businesses. Um, there is a letter that will be going out. I, we sent it out at 11 today. And I think, I don't know if Lizzie's on the phone, we're at over 45 municipal leaders that have already signed on, urging the legislature to act on the economic development bond bill to approve the additional funding for small businesses that's in the supplemental budget and to really think about other creative ways to help our small businesses get through what we know is going to be a dark winter but a short time until you know with warmer months and the vaccine coming if we can help our small businesses make it through that time i think we will you know they'll be able to recover come the summer so we're, we're just trying to get as much resources out as possible to our small businesses and coordinate that with our, our communities to really push on our state leaders to kind of step up and help in the lack of federal inaction. And then, you know, also working with our federal leaders, I, you know, I'm very hopeful that by the end of this week, we'll have some sort of a, another stimulus package from the federal government. We're also trying to look and think a little bit about some of what I'd call the medium term planning. So what are the systems that we're gonna need to get us through the next six months until we have vaccines available or we reach some sort of herd immunity. So we did a great webinar, Barry Keppert and his team led looking at wastewater testing and how to utilize wastewater testing as a monitoring system. I think for the long haul, this is going to be an important support that communities will need to be put in place. And, you know, we're working directly with uh, the city of Chelsea to set up wastewater testing there. We also worked with the communities of Somerville, Medford, Wellesley, Salem, and Tufts University to put on a webinar this week looking at pooled testing as an option for surveillance testing in schools and also for municipal employees. Um, and honestly, it's worth the hour just you know, from a personal level, it was a fascinating webinar to think about this as another tool that's available. So we're you know, consistently trying to figure out how can we help our communities think about what are the other regimes they need to set up um, to help kind of put this infrastructure in place for the long haul, increase testing um, and really provide those surveillance models. And then lastly, as Mark mentioned, our, our health and medical coordinating committee and all of our folks over in municipal governance and in public health continue to do a ton of work just on the ground with individual communities helping them, you know, whether it's helping Chelsea set up their flu vaccination or setting up a group to think about what is the role of local boards of health in distribution of the upcoming vaccines for coronavirus. So all of that work kind of one-on-one -on -one or with small groups of communities continues at the same time. 
happy to answer any questions or if Mark or Adam think there's anything I've missed. There, there's a lot happening at any no, given I mean, moment. It would be impossible to cover it all. Um, Rebecca, Lizzie, uh, Mark Fine and Barry Keppett are our key team on this. There are dozens of other people working on it. I honestly think a third of the agency is working on COVID response and recovery. If you include the recovery side, um, it, it's just, it's a third of the people that are at MAPC at this point. Glad to answer questions. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Mark. And I, and I would add from, from where I sit um, that, you know, the work of Mark and Rebecca and Lizzie and Barry and, and those that I don't get to talk with on the phone as often as I talk with you uh, at the MAPC has been absolutely invaluable and critical to any successes that we've had as municipalities in managing our response to COVID-19. So um, I, I will frankly feel forever indebted to the amazing work that Mark and Rebecca and the team have done. Um, so, and, and, and the, there's a long road ahead and I, I feel great knowing that they're on that road um, leading us. So thank you. Thank and you. I would just say, I, I feel the same about all of our local leaders. You know, we've been doing this work for a long time and the level of collaboration and coordination, I, I've just never seen anything like it. And, you know, I'm hopeful that we can build on that through recovery and really think about, you know, how do we keep that level of regional coordination and collaboration going, you know, in the future. Agreed. Any questions for Mark or Rebecca about this, or Rebecca or Mark? Okay. Well, thank you both again for that. Looks like we're, we're coming to the end of the agenda. Uh, the next agenda item is to announce the rescheduled date of the next executive committee meeting, uh, which we're aiming to schedule for January 27th, 2021. Um, is there any, anything further than that I need to share uh, about that, Rebecca or Mark? No, just, just for people to be aware, it was supposed to be the 20th, but we thought at 1130 on the 20th of January, maybe something else would be going on that people would be interested in. So yeah. we, we, we deferred to the 27th. Great. Thank you. Just correct your calendars if, if you have, if you haven't. If you show up on the 20th, we will not have lunch for you. Sorry. Someday, someday we'll get back for lunch. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, is there any other business not known at the time of the agenda before we wrap up? I think I can actually see everybody on my screen now, so I, I don't see any hands raised. I'm sorry about that before, Jenny. I didn't, I didn't see you raising your hand. Um, all right. Um, thank you to everybody for all the work uh, put into to having this meeting today and all the all the work that is going to continue. Uh, with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? So move. Second. Second. All right, motion's been, I think, made by Mo, seconded by John DePriest. And I will call this roll one last time. All right, I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna keep track of who, who's already left, so I'll just run through. Sharonda? Aye. Keith? Aye. I think we just lost Karen. I vote in the affirmative. Uh, Tom? I think we lost Tom. John yeah, but there, you have a, a list on the, if you click participants, it'll give you a pop-up list of who's here. Yeah, it jumps around when everybody talks, uh, so it doesn't yeah. really work that well. Um, okay. But, uh, Aye. So who, uh, that was John DePriest, you, uh, Sandra? Oh. Mo? Aye. Jared? Aye. Tabor? Aye. Steve? Aye. George? Aye. Jenny? Aye. Sam? Aye. Lauren? Mayor Spicer? Aye. And Elaine? Elaine, sorry. Aye. All right. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Happy holidays. Thank you. Adam. Thank you. Happy holidays. Take care. Thank you. Bye.